Good evening everybody. Welcome to our latest Going Deeper session and we're still in Hebrews 10 this week for the second half of Hebrews 10. I'm going to start with prayer and then we'll get into what the scripture says to us and uh, is speaking to us tonight. Father, I just pray, enlighten your word. Help us to hear something of what your spirit wants to say to us. And Lord God, let it build us and strengthen us and cause us to grow in you as we look forward to your return. Thank you, Father. Amen. So Hebrews 2, 9, sorry, 10, 19 to 39. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. For if we go on sinning wilfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more, how much severer punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has regarded, regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. And it's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But remember the former days when after being enlightened you endured a great conflict of sufferings, partly by being made a public spectacle through reproaches and tribulations and partly by becoming sharers with those who were so treated. For you showed sympathy to the prisoners and accepted joyfully the seizure of your property, knowing that you have for yourselves a better possession and a lasting one. Therefore do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God you may receive what was promised. For yet in a very little while he who is coming will come and will not delay, but my righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not those of, of those who shrink back to destruction, but of those who have faith to the pres preserving of our soul. These verses form the culmination of everything that has come before. As we've considered Jesus and the means he has brought about to give us assurance of salvation, so we now come to the purpose of it all, to come together in worship. Everything has been set in place and every barrier has been removed so that we can worship God together in full assurance of faith. And this is the great privilege we have as Christians, access into the presence of God to worship him. Let's consider this some more. Firstly, the purpose of the cross was to open the way to worship. The purpose of Jesus' sacrifice was to open up that way for us to come into the presence of God both individually and corporately. And when we celebrate communion together, it is this that we are remembering, that we can only come to worship together because of what Jesus has achieved on our behalf. When we come to worship together, we are walking the path that he has already opened up in going before us to bring us into the presence of God. The holy place mentioned here is not the holy of holies in the temple in Jerusalem, rather it is the presence of God who comes amongst us when we come together. We are now the temple of the living God, his dwelling place on earth. And that has all been made possible through our great high priest, who has not only gone into the holy place on our behalf, carrying his own blood, but has opened up the way so that we all can come into that holy place. And when we do so, we don't come with the stain and guilt of sin hanging to us, rather are we coming cleansed by the completed work of Jesus. And so having received this privilege of drawing near, 
at great cost to Jesus. Let us use it because through it the stain and guilt of sin is removed from us. We have nothing to fear any longer when we come into the presence of God. No fear of judgment, no guilt from past sins, no fear of exposure. We can now come boldly before him in the knowledge that Jesus' sacrifice has opened the way, cleansed us from our sin and made us able to stand before him with a sincere, that means real, genuine, true as opposed to deceitful heart. And so now that we have access through Christ, the writer encourages us, don't neglect worship. In these next few verses, the writer uses the phrase, let us three times. And this means he's encouraging us towards access in response to all that Jesus has done for us. And so having established the purpose of the cross through the, through the whole of the book, the writer moves into practical mode with three letter statements. Firstly, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we confess, we profess, trusting in God's faithfulness. Secondly, let us consider how to spur one another toward love and good deeds. And then thirdly, let us not get out of the habit of meeting together for worship, but actually do it more and more in the light of Jesus' imminent return. These are three keys to living in the good of all that Jesus has done. Trust in God's faithfulness and don't let go. Look to bless and encourage others in the body of Christ at all times and in every way possible. And make sure you attend, as you can't be a blessing and you can't be blessed corporately. And you can't participate in our worship, in worship together, if you don't attend. Gathering is so important. And so what these verses emphasise is the corporateness of our faith. Receiving salvation is just not, it's not just about me and God. It's about becoming part of a body of people. And actually, you cannot exercise your faith properly except within a body of people. Each one of us needs the mutual encouragement, blessing, support, help, teaching and fellowship that being part of a body gives us. And together we confess our faith through singing and through testimony. And together we stimulate one another towards love and good deeds. And together we encourage one another as we look forward to the day of Christ's return. And so having encouraged us, uh, uh, encouraged us to gather and to worship and to have the access, uh, use the access that we have the privilege of receiving through Jesus Christ, he now moves into warning mode, the opposite side. He says, don't step back. We have a warning against stepping back after receiving the truth. Who is this addressed to? Well, in the first few centuries of the church, such warnings were taking, taken seriously. They considered this to mean serious willful sin following baptism, such as renouncing Christ, which caused many in, in the early church to delay their baptism, including Emperor Constantine himself, until just before they died, in case they committed it and lost their salvation in their perception. Also in North Africa, part of the church, the Donatists split away from the rest of the church over this issue because they believed that if a Christian, even under persecution, renounced Christ, but late, even late if they later repented, they couldn't be restored as they would be trampling the Son of God underfoot, as it says in verse 29. And so there's a warning about going back which the early church took very seriously. In keeping with the verses we looked at in Hebrews 6, however, I would suggest once again that it's those who have heard the truth come amongst us in fellowship, but never really committed themselves in faith to God to which this is addressed. It's not addressed to genuine Christian who falls from grace for a period. Nevertheless, we should all take such warnings seriously because they do foreshadow a day of reckoning which we must all go through. And the reality is we don't like such warnings from scripture. We like everything to be soft and cuddly. We like to talk about love and blessings and and grace and things like that but this is the one of the most serious warnings in scripture it says basically don't step back because God won't reward you for nearly coming to faith if you then go on to repudiate it and deny it the reality is as we've said there is a judgment coming and everyone must face it and God will hold everyone to account for the decisions they have made and if they've chosen to reject Jesus, even after they've heard about all he's done for them, then it's to them 
that these verses apply. If there is no accounting for the choices humans make in this life, then there can be no justice. Essentially, if we take away the notion of judgment, we're saying that people can do whatever they like in this life and it doesn't matter. God will forgive them in the end anyway. And that just makes a nonsense of grace. It's only knowledge of the final judgment and with that knowledge that we can live with the injustices of this world. And it was certainly that knowledge that allowed the early Christians to endure such unfair and unjust persecutions at the hands of the Roman authorities. And I'm sure even in our own day where Christians are persecuted, it's only that knowledge that ultimately God will give them justice and that there is justice in the universe that helps them to endure. And this brings us to the next part, verses 32 to 36, where we're encouraged to persevere. And the important encouragement in this part of the passage is for Christians who are facing difficulties and persecution to persevere even in the midst of the suffering and persecution because even if we lose all now, we will ultimately gain a much greater reward. And this is the flip side of the coin from the warning. The warning side says don't step back. The flip side says persevere, press on so that you will receive the full blessing of that for which you came to faith in the first place. Remember we've said that this book is spoken to those who are tempted to slip back into Judaism in order to hide from would-be oppressors. And the writer reminds his audience how they responded initially when they heard about the persecutions that were going on and encourages them to continue in the same vein. What should keep them going is their confidence in all that Jesus has achieved and in their future hope of vindication and reward. The writer reminds his audience that when they first came to faith, they too suffered persecution and endured it, and they stood, stood with others who were going through it. His, now is not the time, he says, to throw away your confidence, i.e. confidence in what Jesus has done and in the future outcome of the work he has begun in you, the future reward. This is the time, he says, to press on, regardless, with the end in sight. And no matter what we're going through in this day, no matter what suffering, no matter what challenge we're going through, this is a word for us to endure, press on, keep going. The end is in sight and Jesus is coming back soon and there is a day of reckoning and a day of reward coming when all things will be put to rights. And so he finishes with that, with that promise that it won't be long before the Lord is coming. Look forward in faith to the coming of the Lord. Through endurance we will receive the fullness of the promises. And the encouragement is for us to continue to live by faith as we, uh, and, and just as we received our salvation by faith. And so we're encouraged to continue to live in it by faith. And as we do so we can look forward to the reward of our faith when the Lord returns, which is complete salvation. In the following chapter, of course, the writer gives many examples of people who did just that. And we'll begin to look at that, what it means to endure with faith, to continue in faith, even when circumstances say otherwise. In that great passage of the heroes of the faith, Hebrews chapter 11. God bless you. And Father, I pray that something of what I've shared tonight might go deep into our hearts to help us to endure, to help us to continue, to help us to persevere, but also to help us to take the privileges that we have of coming to worship you without the stain, without the blemish, without the guilt of, of sin that once entangled us. Coming to give you rightful worship in the house which is your temple, your body. Amen. God bless you all.